Welcome to Understanding Behaviour Changes. In this session, you'll learn how dementia affects behaviour and what you might consider when attempting to understand why certain behaviours are occurring. We'll discuss strategies for responding and work through a few scenarios together. This webinar is directed at caregivers, that is, someone caring for or connected with someone living with dementia. The information covered in this session is generic across all dementias. Some of the information may not be applicable to your current situation, but may or may not become more relevant in the future as the disease progresses. All behaviours have a reason, a cause and a meaning, and it is so important for us to listen to the behaviour. Behaviour is an attempt to communicate. The person living with dementia might be trying to tell you something they can't articulate because of changes in their communication abilities. Take a moment to think about what you might do if you're hungry and couldn't use your words to tell someone, or you try to tell them and the words become mixed up and despite your best efforts, you cannot be understood. Or perhaps you're too hot, or the room is too loud, or you're bored. Think about how you might express these needs to someone. Someone's behaviour may be an expression of an unmet need, such as needing a glass of water or to go to the bathroom. So the person may be trying to tell you that they need something, but they're having difficulty expressing what it is. Or the behaviour may be a way of meeting a need. For example, the person make may repeat sounds or vocalisations that they find are comforting or stimulating or a way of satisfying their own need for conversation. Or behaviour changes may simply be related to physical or structural changes in the brain. Behavioural symptoms are very individual and can change from day to day and week to week. Not everyone with dementia expresses the changes that we are going to learn more about. Although it's hard, try not to take the behaviours personally. People with dementia don't behave in uncharacteristic ways on purpose. These are symptoms of the disease in their brain. They're doing the best they can with what they have left, even if it doesn't always appear that way. They're not doing it on purpose to irritate you. If you haven't already seen our Understanding Dementia videos, I strongly encourage you to do so, as they can help you understand the effects of dementia on the brain. These videos are, are linked on our website. There are a long list of behaviours that people have shared with us. It's important to recognise not everyone will experience these particular behaviours that include agitation, confusion, disinhibition or loss of inhibitions, which may include swearing, rude or racist comments, unwanted sexual advances, theft, erratic driving, delusions or false belief, hallucinations, which involve the senses and are more visual, or visual mistakes, which are often mistaken for hallucinations, but are caused when the brain misinterprets what it is seeing. For example, mistaking a hanging coat for a person. There may also be reactive or responsive behaviours, where the person is responding to something in their environment and perhaps feeling like they need to protect themselves by biting, hitting, throwing something or rearranging furniture. They may have repetitive behaviours, a loss of initiative, experience pacing or wondering. Take a moment to look at this list. Are any of these familiar to you? Regardless of what possible behaviour changes you are noticing, a person with a dementia has a disease that is causing damage to their brain. And because of these brain changes, we cannot teach a person with dementia how to change their behaviour. The behaviours we see are often the result of changes in the brain. It's not something they can control. They may not even be aware that they're acting a certain way. What we can do is learn new strategies for adapting how we respond to and cope with changes in behaviour. Even though it can be difficult, try not to take it personally. It's the disease and not the person. Reframing how we perceive a behaviour can help us better understand why it is occurring and how to respond. 
Tom Kitwood says, when the emphasis is on a person, behaviour is not seen as a problem to be managed, but rather actions and expressions that need to be understood. Instead of seeing the behaviour as a challenge, look on it as an opportunity to connect. When we stop to consider the person, who they are, what they enjoy, what their life history is, it becomes easier to make this connection. By problem solving why behaviours occur, we can better strategize ways to respond. It's about us, not them. Take a deep breath, step back and think, what is going on here? And be a detective. Ask yourself, so what? What would happen if I ignore the behaviour? If the answer is nothing, then perhaps it's not a behaviour that needs to be changed. Consider whether there are any safety risks to the person or others. Does it impose on the person's dignity, like disrobing in public? Who is it the affecting, me or them? As an example, imagine I'm caring for Joan, who likes to play the same CD every day, all day, every day. It's starting to drive me crazy and any attempts to get her to change the CD end in conflict. Take a step back and does it really matter if she really listens to the same CD every day? Let's do the so what test. Consider, there's no safety risk. It doesn't impose on her dignity. It seems to bring her enjoyment. The behavior is affecting me and not her. I could put headphones in. I could leave the room. If it's really affecting me, I could try dancing with her to a different CD to make the change of CD fun. But let's compare it with another example. Does it matter if Joan constantly hides her medication? In this case, there is a safety risk. And if I ignore it, she may continue to not take the, her medication or could find a pile later and take a lot at once. She could have an adverse health effect. You could keep the medication in your possession, stay with her while she takes it, or consider taking a vitamin or another medication, perhaps even a fake medication like a Tic Tac, alongside her, so you're taking your medication together. If she has anxiety about taking a medication, ask your doctor if it can be added to her food instead. Become a detective and figure out why she's hiding her medication. Let's spend some time on how to be a good detective. Over the next few slides, we'll go into a few detailed approaches to recognize and respond to different behaviors. This will give you a good framework to take away with you to best support someone experiencing behavior changes. You're probably familiar with the five W's, what, where, when, who, and why. By stepping back from the behavior and the emotions that can be triggered in us, using the five W's with curiosity can help us look for patterns that might reveal what the person is trying to communicate. First off, what? What is going on? Is this behavior something that we want or need to change? Is anyone in danger? Where is it happening? Is it always happening in the same place? Is the environment scary, confusing, uncomfortable, loud, too busy, etc.? Can things be changed in the environment or can the place be avoided? When is it happening? Is it a time of day or when a particular noise happens? May it be an indication of the person's energy level at a particular time of day? Does the person think they should be doing something else at that time of day? Who is involved or around when it's happening? Family, staff or volunteers? People with dementia may find certain individuals difficult to deal with because of a past memory or their voice level or many other reasons. Why is there a trigger? What happened just before? What happened earlier that day? Is it task related? Is it physical, for example, hunger or thirst? Put this into practice, let's take a look at an example of how you would go through the five W's. The situation is that Margaret loudly rummages through the kitchen drawers every morning. So let's start with 
what? What is going on here? What can I see? What can I observe? Look at Margaret. What's her emotional state? Does she seem scared, anxious, or content? Is there anything in the drawer that can harm her? Is she leaving the drawer items on the floor, creating tripping hazards? If yes to the above, there's a possible danger to this behavior and intervention is needed. If not, there may not be a need to intervene. Where is it happening? The rummaging only happens in the kitchen and involves several drawers. Depending on how many drawers are involved, could items be redistributed in the kitchen so that hazardous items are out of Margaret's reach? If all of the drawers are involved, consider installing cupboard locks to make the cupboards inaccessible to Margaret. Or provide an alternative safe space to rummage close by. When is it happening? The rummaging always occurs in the morning after she gets dressed and lasts for half an hour before Margaret moves to the living room to rest. Who is involved? No one is around when Margaret rummages. She engages in the behaviour regardless of if others are in the kitchen with her. Why? Is there a trigger? It appears that the time when Margaret rummages is a part of her daily schedule. It doesn't appear to be an additional trigger. She may be looking for a particular item or rearranging the cupboards to match the organisation of her previous home's kitchen cupboards. When trying to figure out why a behaviour is occurring, there are four areas to check out. Physical, environmental, task orientated, and communication. The detective work is figuring out what may be causing the person difficulties. The solution comes in making changes and seeing if they make a difference. Keep in mind that every individual is different and what works with one person may not work with the next and what works today might not work next week and vice versa. You may need to continue trying different things in order to get a response or be understood. These next four slides are pretty dense with information. Don't try to remember or learn all the information. Rather, simply try to pick out what resonates with you and your situation. Allow the information to make you curious about the why behind the behaviours you are seeing. Let's consider some physical reasons for a behaviour. As we go through the list, remember that people with dementia increasingly lose the ability to express their needs as the disease progresses. There's a fairly high occurrence of depression in people living with dementia. It is underdiagnosed but can be treated. Medication could have a side effect or interaction. This includes some herbal supplements. Consult with your doctor before starting any new herbal supplements or vitamins. There could be an acute illness, for example, a urinary tract infection, fever or flu. If you notice a sudden change in behavior, explore possible illnesses or chronic illnesses like diabetes or arthritis. As mentioned, people with dementia often become increasingly less able to express their needs, including the fact that they're experiencing discomfort or pain. Undiagnosed pain can give rise to many behaviours. Pain can have a profound impact on how we behave. If you suspect pain may be an issue, ask, does it hurt? Can you show me where it hurts? Keep in mind that the person can't always tell you if it hurts or where it hurts. They may also be unable to experience pain in the way that we do. Constipation can be very painful and may affect hunger, mood and overall comfort. Dehydration can exacerbate the symptoms of dementia. With hunger, some people with dementia metabolize food more quickly. Also, for people with cognitive impairments, daily routine is hard work and hard work, work requires more fuel. Try more frequent smaller meals or you may need to alter routines, for example, eating before the morning ritual of getting dressed, washing and brushing teeth. Sometimes a few crackers on a bedside table can be enough to satisfy the person until breakfast. Or fatigue. When the brain is compromised by dementia, it is tiring work to stay alert. The brain has to find detours to perform normal functions 
allow extra time to rest in the day as the disease progresses. Now let's look at the environment for things that may be triggering a behaviour. Is the space too big or too small for the person with dementia? What type of space is the person used to? Their past history is likely filled with clues to help you figure out what type of environment is best suited to the person. Unfamiliar decor or furniture can be unsettling and even inhibit independence if the person doesn't know how to use something like dimmer switches or a hidden flush on the toilet. You can use contrast to highlight the features you want to draw attention to, like a light switch or the toilet, and decrease contrast to discourage the use of features you don't want attention on, like a drawer of sharp cooking utensils. For example, a brightly coloured light switch against a beige wall helps the person find it. Contrast between the colour of the floor and the walls can help with depth perception at judging the size of a room, particularly as the disease progresses. Conversely, high contrast on the floor, like black tiles or a dark rug on a light floor, can appear like a hole and may be frightening. Glare can look like water on the floor and confusing patterns can be unfamiliar or overwhelming. Is the space too cluttered? This can be too stimulating and can distract from communication. Clutter can contribute to shadows, which can be perceived as people or things that are not there and which may be frightening. This is called a visual mistake. And lastly, there may be no cues or indications of where things are. Keep this in mind when trying to discourage a behaviour. For example, if the person is leaving the house when they shouldn't be, remove coats, shoes or keys from the entranceway. Damage to the parts of the brain responsible for processing language can cause difficulties with communication. This can result in receptive aphasia or difficulty understanding the language coming in, expressive aphasia, difficulty with language going out, that is generating a response. You may notice that the person has trouble putting words together in a sentence. Anomia refers to mixing up the names of objects or people. For example, asking for the broccoli but being passed the peas, which is the word that actually came out of your mouth. You can imagine how frustrating it may be to be regularly misunderstood. Are there hearing issues that are impacting communication? Are hearing aids in and working properly? Is there background noise that's making it difficult to hear? Or might it be a result of damage to the auditory cortex, which affects the ability to distinguish between sounds? Is there trouble with vision? Do they have their glasses? Or could damage to the occipital lobe be affecting their vision? Damage to this part of the brain results in loss of depth perception and an impaired ability to see movement and a narrowing of peripheral vision, giving tunnel vision. There could be too many choices that could be overwhelming and add to confusion. Are they being asked too many open-ended questions? This can add to trouble with making a decision and lead to frustration when confused. And of course, loss of vocabulary is going to impact communication. Changes in the hippocampus and temporal lobe may mean that the word for something is no longer accessible, and this can be a tremendous source of frustration. If any of these sound familiar to you or you would like more information on communication, please make sure to check out our other previously recorded webinars on communication, which go into this in greater detail than we have time for now. Have you noticed that familiar tasks seem to take a long time to accomplish? There may be some good reasons why a task may result in certain behaviours, and there are strategies that you can use to adapt tasks to changed abilities. The task may be too complicated. To help, you can break down the task into smaller steps and demonstrate the steps as you instruct. However, it can also be that the task may have too many steps. The person may have forgotten some of the steps and feel stuck, so keep the number of steps to a minimum. There may be too many choices, which can be overwhelming. 
It can be helpful to limit the number of choices offered. For example, would you like coffee or tea rather than what would you like to drink? Is the task unfamiliar? Look at whether the task is something that can be recognised from a person's earlier years, or is it new? It is very likely that using a computer or technology will become unfamiliar to someone as the disease progresses. It could be that the person is experiencing a loss of initiative, which can result from damage to the frontal lobe. We can help the person switch on to a task by showing them how and participating with them. You can also try presenting the task in different ways, like changing the time of day, location, with or without music, etc. Fear or uncertainty can stem from unfamiliarity with a task. The person may be overwhelmed by the sensory stimulation of an environment, or they may be uncertain about their ability to do the task. All people need to engage with some sort of activity that they find meaningful. Is the task something they're simply not interested in, like refusing to paint because the person has never liked painting? Is there another task that you can give the person that they will find more interesting? Consider someone might not like setting the table for dinner, but they love folding napkins. You may feel a bit overwhelmed by all the information at this point. So take a few moments to breathe and reflect on how you're feeling. That was a lot of information, only some of which will have been relevant to you and your situation. So take a couple of deep breaths and know that it's quite normal if you're feeling overwhelmed. And let's take a look at some strategies. The good thing is that helpful strategies for responding fall into just three broad categories, making it easier to try to remember them. Validate, reassure, and distract or redirect. Let's dig into these a little bit more. In order to validate, you need to start by taking a few deep breaths to calm your own emotional brain. Focus on the person's feelings rather than their words. Do they appear frustrated, sad, or anxious? Avoid using logic or reasoning. Thinking skills won't work with anyone experiencing heightened emotions, whether that person has dementia or not. Validate the person by putting yourself in their reality. If they're upset because they believe they have to go to work, rather than correcting them by telling them they're retired, Validate their feelings and provide comfort. Try to connect and not correct. It can be helpful to think of it this way. We have our reality and the person with dementia has theirs. As the disease progresses, our shared reality will become smaller and smaller. Are we trying to bring the person back into our reality or are we willing to meet them in theirs? It may feel like fibbing, but validating their reality and what they're experiencing is fundamentally different from lying to the person because of the motivation behind it. We are not trying to fool them or trick them to get something for ourselves. Instead, we try to step into their reality because we are aware of the changes in their brain and we are trying to provide comfort and support. Kindness is more important than truth here. Dementia is a brain disease, and so someone whose brain has been damaged by dementia cannot make the changes necessary to join our reality, but we can validate what is real to them in their reality. So when Jane wants to go home to the farm and see her mum, it's distressing and painful to try and remind her that her mum has been dead for 30 years and the farm no longer exists. What Jane needs in that moment is reassurance that she's going to see someone who loves her and be in a place that is reassuring. Listen for cues you can give that can give you the words to respond. Oh, I'd love to go with you. What would we see on the farm? Or you really love your mum. What's one of your favourite memories of her from when you were little? Or even, yes, we'll go there soon, but we need to have lunch first. Let's go to the kitchen and get ready. 
All of these responses support Jane's reality and speak to the needs behind her statement, a sense of love and security. The second strategy for responding is to reassure. Agree with the person rather than arguing. This will ease the frustration for both of you and will prevent escalation of a behavior. Accept blame when you can, even when you didn't do it. The person with dementia may be feeling unsure themselves. Taking the blame may ease their anxiety or uncertainty. For example, I'm sorry, mom, I must have moved your glasses when I was cleaning. I'll make sure to put them back next time. Reassure the person that things will be okay. They may feel insecure about something or simply be in need of comfort from a person they trust. For example, I know going to the doctor can be scary. I'll help you the whole time. I'm here for you. It will be okay. And finally, the third strategy for responding is distracting or redirection. It's a way of breaking the person's attention by engaging them in something different, such as a new topic of conversation or a new activity. For example, would you like some tea and cookies? Or would you like to help me set the table for dinner? You can distract or redirect with a familiar activity that the person with dementia enjoys or sees meaning in, for example, watering plants or looking at a photo album. This strategy can be particularly useful if the person appears to be perseverating or stuck on a topic or task. But it's very important to validate and reassure first. Don't try to jump straight to distracting. We all need to feel heard before we can move on. It's helpful to ensure that you keep a record of the behavior, the five W's and how you responded. That way you can look back and see what was successful and repeat it and what was not so you can try something else. If we think of the example of Jane wanting to go home to the farm to see her mum, the responses really involve all three strategies. For example, oh, I'd love to go there with you. Validation and reassurance. What would we see on the farm? Distraction. Or, yes, we'll go there soon. This validates her reality that her mum is still alive and provides reassurance through agreement and letting her know that the desired thing will happen soon. But we need to have lunch first. Let's go to the kitchen and get ready. This is a good distraction involving movement and a familiar anticipated activity. Keeping a record of all this information in a journal can help you see patterns and develop a range of coping strategies. It will help you also better identify under which circumstances one strategy works better than another. Let's look at some examples. I'm going to take a couple of minutes with each one of these. Your person has a prearranged doctor's appointment that you've been discussing for the past few days. When you mention that it's time to leave to go to the appointment, they say, what doctor's appointment? There's nothing wrong with me. How might you respond using the three strategies that we just looked at? Validate, reassure, and distract. And again, this is a prearranged doctor's appointment that you've been discussing for the past several days, but now it's time to go. And this is the response. What doctor's appointment? There's nothing wrong with me. You could offer a short explanation. It's just a regular checkup. Or you, if you might find it hard, you can accept the blame. Oh, I'm sorry if I forgot to tell you. Let's look at a different example. Unfortunately, many caregivers have experienced this example over the years. Imagine your spouse suddenly says to you, who are you? Where's my wife? What could you say in response? Can you see how you would need to probably take a deep breath to calm your own emotional response? Then you could reassure. I'm a friend of Audrey's. She had to step out and asked me to come by. She'll be back in time for dinner. Even if you are the she in question. In that moment, you're not the person he's looking for. He may be thinking of a 30 year old you and trying to convince him that you are that person simply won't work. Reassurance is all that is in order to be helpful. 
or you could distract or redirect. Would you like some cookies? I feel like a cookie. Again, make sure you reassure first before distracting or redirecting. Try to think if you've made a simple change that ended up making a big difference in your person's behavior. The best solutions come from our knowledge of the person and our own creativity. You'll have to adjust your responses for where the person is at in the disease. Behaviour isn't isolated and all of us behave in response to environment, communication and stressors. We can meet the person with dementia where they're at by adapting how we communicate, managing our own stress response and engaging with them in activities that are meaningful to who they are. All of this supports a person to function at their optimum level. Earlier, we discussed unmet needs as a possible reason why certain behaviours may occur. Human beings have a fundamental need to engage in activity that is purposeful and has a sense of meaning. Yitka Zagoa, who wrote Doing Things, says, Activity of some kind, whether it is work or play, is, to most people, synonymous with living. It is the way each person defines himself and his role in society and exerts control over the world around him. Engaging people in activities that are meaningful to them is one way we can prevent challenging behaviours from occurring or from escalating if a behaviour has already begun. You can use anxiety reducing activities such as going for a walk or sorting objects to help distract from feelings of restlessness or agitation. Activities are also important for making us feel useful and to combat boredom. They offer psychological benefits, for example, expending excess energy, calming someone down, which in turn have positive effects on a person's sleep and reducing agitation. When activities are meaningful to the person, they help improve mood, reduce negative feelings and boost self-esteem. They also allow the person to continue some roles that make them who they are. For example, a mother, a nurse, a baker, an artist, and the list goes on. When you're trying to decide what activities may be meaningful, think about the person in the context of their life history, not just their more recent past. What was their occupation? What was their passion? Was there something they would habitually do every day? Answering these questions helps us identify what activities the person may find meaningful. For example, a person who used to work as a server may find meaning in helping to wipe up the dining table after dinner. It's familiar to them. Someone who used to make furniture may enjoy sanding a piece of wood. When trying to engage someone living with dementia in an activity, consider the remaining skills and knowledge of the person. What are they still able to do? What has brought them comfort in the past? Be mindful of physical and cognitive limitations, but don't underestimate what the person can do. Also consider giving a reason for the activity or task. People are generally more inclined to do something if they know why they're doing it. Framing the activity as something that would be helpful to you may increase the likelihood that the person will want to engage in the activity. For example, I'm having trouble matching these socks. Can you sort them for me? It would be a big help. It doesn't matter if they're all sorted correctly. Offer choices, but try to keep it limited to not overwhelm the person. For example, do you want to peel the potatoes or stir the sauce? Where possible, try to maintain a regular routine. Completing regular activities at the same time each day helps the person know what to expect and decreases feelings of confusion or anxiety over not knowing what is next. And lastly, be flexible. Preferences may change and abilities will change. Someone who has cleaned their house every week their whole life may not want to clean anymore, especially if he or she never liked it to begin with. Activities don't have to be cumbersome. Listening to music is an example of a simple activity that can have both relaxing and rejuvenating effects for the person, depending on the type of music selected. If the person consistently appears uninterested or unmotivated in all activities, and this is accompanied by a persistent sadness, 
hopelessness, or low self-esteem, talk to their doctor about the possibility of depression. Before we wrap up, I'm going to share with you a quote, quote from Arne Garborg. To love a person is to learn the song that is in their heart and to sing it to them when they have forgotten. Behaviour is communication and an opportunity to connect with the person living with dementia. We may not always respond the way we would like in the moment, but it is your intentions that are important. No one goes into this as the perfect caregiver, nor are you expected to be. It can be challenging to cope with these behaviours and to keep up with the changes. And as caregivers, it's very important to take time to care for yourself so you have the ability to be the patient caregiver that you want to be. Being a caregiver is hard, but you're not in it alone. If you're interested in connecting with other caregivers and sharing experiences, you can call our First Link Dementia Helpline for more information about virtual support groups and support for you. Thank you for watching this webinar today. If you have questions about the information that you've heard here or any other questions about living with dementia or you're interested in support groups or other supports, please don't hesitate to call our First Link Dementia Helpline. English services are available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. till 8 p.m. at 1800 936 6033. Services are also available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Punjabi, Cantonese and Mandarin at the numbers listed on the screen. Thank you.